I want to refer to Jeremiah chapter 23, and I've chosen to use as variety something from the ERV, the easy to read version, and it really is a brilliant paraphrase, sometimes not as accurate as it might be here and there in some verses, but otherwise this sort of English speaks to us, I think, in a very real way. Jeremiah is tortured by the fact that there is error and lies amongst preachers. He's not saying, well, that's fine, they're all doing well, they're all good people, no problem, move on. He's not of that type at all. In fact, he suffers miserably by taking a stand for truth. What they did with Jeremiah and all the prophets was to discard him. They lowered him into a mud pit, got rid of him. And that's what people will do with the truth. If they don't like it, they try to get rid of the messenger. It will be a very bad day for the shepherds of the people of Judah. Now you might say, well, why are we reading this? Because we're not living in that particular era of history in which Jeremiah was living. But I remind you that these things are written for the future time. In the latter days, the final days, all of this stuff will become very clear to us. So I think we have every reason for reading it today because, because we believe we're living in the last days. How close to the second coming, we don't know. But that wonderful statement is there twice there. 2320. In the last days, you will clearly understand this. And that's repeated in chapter 30. So it will be a very bad day, 23 verse 1 of the ERV, the easy to read version. It will be a very bad day for the shepherds, the pastors of the people of Judah. They're destroying the sheep. What? Destroying the sheep? Excuse me. You could go to church on a Sunday and be destroyed by what you're hearing from the pulpit. This is an awful threat. They are making the sheep run from my pasture in all directions. This message is from Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord God. They'd better be very careful who they elect as a pastor, but the pastor's responsibility is under God to preach the truth, the truth, the truth, and nothing but the truth. If they're preaching lies, they're destroying themselves and the people they're speaking to. This is a very serious issue. It's combined deception, but both by those who choose wrongly and those who appoint themselves wrongly. Now, verse 2 says, they are responsible for my people. He's talking about the shepherds now, the pastors. Those who are self-ordained, wrongly, or even the ones who were originally at least ordained by God, they are responsible for my people. Note that, all pastors, all who get up on a Sunday and give their opinion from the Constitution, which is the Bible for us, and this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to them. You shepherds have made my sheep run away in all directions. You have forced them to go away. You have not taken care of them, but I'll take care of you. I'll punish you for the evil things you did. This message is from Yahweh. Verse 3, I sent my sheep to other countries, but I will gather together my sheep that are left. This is the constant story of the Bible. God is scattering people. They're being divided. They're being sent off in various directions. But you haven't seen anything yet, as they say more colloquially in Georgia. God is going to gather, 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 and bring all things into one, finally, in the kingdom. And he's going to appoint shepherds over the people who will teach them the truth. But that's not the situation now. So it's always a gloomy message, or very often a gloomy message, from the prophets. Verse 3, when my sheep are back in their pasture, they will have many children and grow in number. The Bible is a very simple book. It's all the bad stuff followed by the good stuff. It's a pretty bad scene now, the prophets say, over and over and over. But wait till the kingdom comes. And then you'll have lots of children. I love that one. The growth and children and the parable of the sower and bearing fruit. That's the good side of the story that we all should be aiming at. I will place new shepherds over my sheep. That's encouraging. That's heartening. They will take care of my sheep and my sheep will never again feel afraid. We aren't there yet. Never again. Once this is finally fulfilled, it will never go bad again. That's wonderful. But right now we're still in the, in the disaster situation of lots of false shepherds failing their people by not telling them the truth. Verse 5. Then the camera pans in the, in the great plot that is the Bible. It's a marvelous drama. No film was ever made as exciting as the biblical film. The camera pans immediately to one of the aspects of the good time coming, which is the good branch. Who is that? It's the Messiah. 
The message is from the Lord, verse 5. The time is coming. We're on tiptoe, stretching our necks forward into this future time. The time is coming when I will raise up, when I will put on the human scene, that means, a good branch from David's family. This is a Jewish book, folks. This is not a Western uh, philosophical book. It's a Jewish book. Jesus preached uh, on praying about the kingdom. That's exactly what he'd learned in the synagogue. May your kingdom come. The Jews were preaching. May he establish his kingdom quickly in your days. Let that happen quickly. Same thing here about David then. The camera, we might say, pans often onto the Davidic aspect of what we're talking about. He will be a king who will rule in a wise way. Isn't that exactly what Americans are struggling for today? Switch on one of your, your channels, and it's all about the election. People are interested in nothing except who's going to get elected. And they're voting sometimes for homosexual people. doesn't matter. They don't care about that. But the Bible does care about that. So the voting standards then in the Bible are rather different from even the best that the, the news can do. But my point is that election and selection is everything that Americans talk about practically. It's amazing to me. The parallel is very important. I remember at school, we were asked to write essays on compare and contrast. That's exactly what you can do with the news now. It's all about electing so-and-so. He's going to be the best one. He's, he'll solve the problems. But my point is the parallel with your life and the selection and election of the Christians is exact and needs to be pondered. The good branch there is in verse 5, the Davidic branch, a descendant of the royal family of David. No wonder then Matthew and Luke begin their Gospels with a huge family tree, don't they? That's interesting to me. He'll be a king, it says, who will rule in a wise way. There's the Gospel. He won't put up with any nonsense, and if you buck his system, eventually you're not going to survive. That's why Jesus said there in Luke 19, 27, a verse that you don't hear preached very often, Jesus said, bring those who don't want me to be king over them in front of me and slaughter them in my presence. Did you hear that? How many times is your pastor preaching that verse? That ultimately is justice. Justice is coming. We all cry out for justice. And it's coming eventually. I'm not for a moment suggesting that you should execute that justice. Now, don't do it. Let the state do what it has to do, and it will do what it has to do under God's provision. But for the moment, you're not doing that. But the time is coming when you won't be involved in justice because you're going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Do you know those verses? Jesus said, I will give you Christians the power to rule the nations as a rod of iron, just as my Father gave it to me, Jesus. I get it. God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gives it to you. I didn't hear about any of this in the Church of England days. Maybe I wasn't paying attention, but it wasn't part of what we did. He will do what is fair and right in the land. Hallelujah. Don't we all want that? Isn't that exactly what people are asking for? It's coming, but it's not coming in the way that many people hope for. When he rules, verse 6, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in security and safety. For the moment, the world is struggling you know, to see who's building the, the biggest weapon possible to destroy the rest of the world. It's a terrifying situation. The world has gone horribly wrong, but that's not going to be forever. This will be his name. The name of this branch, this messianic figure. The Lord makes things right for us. I like that translation. God makes everything right where it's all gone wrong. This is salvation. And the whole principle is very clear. So the time is coming in verse 7, says Yahweh, the Lord God, when people will not make a promise by saying, as surely as the Lord lives, the one who brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. They won't say that anymore, looking back at the Exodus. But people will say something new. As surely as the Lord lives, the one who brought the Israelites out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he'd sent them, then the people of Israel will live in their own land. There you have the whole glance at future prophecy. There's coming a future destruction, invasion of Israel in the Middle East by ten nations listed in Psalm 83. We haven't time to read it all today. And finally, God will gather them from that future great tribulation into the land and never, ever, ever again will they be kicked out of the land. That's what you're looking forward to. If that's not the plot that's animating your life, then you haven't got the gospel very clear. A judgment against false prophets, verse 9. A message from God to the prophets, to the preachers, to those who expound the Bible Sunday by Sunday. I'm very sad 
My heart is broken. All my bones are shaking because of the Lord Yahweh and his holy words. Are you very sad? Are your bones shaking because of the Lord and his holy words? I'm like a man who's drunk. The land of Judah is full of people who commit adultery. Heaven forbid. They say the divorce rate is about the same in and out of the church in Georgia. That's a shocking state of affairs. Are we shaking? Are we heartbroken over this? The Lord cursed the land and it became very dry. Here's the image from nature. Things are not growing properly. The fields have become like the desert. The prophets are evil. The preachers are evil. They use their influence and power in the wrong way. I've seen them doing evil things in my own temple. This message is from Yahweh. I will stop giving them my messages. They will walk in darkness. The road will be slippery for those prophets and priests, and they will fall in that darkness. I'll bring disaster on them. This is an awfully gloomy message. I'll punish them. This message is from Yahweh. I saw the prophets of Samaria doing wrong things. This is verse 13. I saw them prophesy in the name of the false god Baal. What if the Trinitarian God is a false god? The church fathers, I read in all the expert books, the church fathers wanted a compromise between the Jewish creed and the creed of paganism. A compromise? I don't think so. That was the fatal thing that Israel got wrong all the time. They want to be like the world. So what if the church fathers took us astray? Then the Reformation was right. But was it a complete enough restoration? Luther said, burn the synagogues and kill the Jews. Do you think Lutherans know that? They don't bother to find out. Why not? Why don't the Seventh-day Adventists bother to find out what their guru, who called herself more than a prophet, is, what she said about the millennium? Do you even know? What good are you to those SDAs? I would suggest, until you find out what they believe. Okay, I've seen the prophets of Jerusalem, listen to Jeremiah here, verse 14, doing sinful things. They're committing adultery, not necessarily literally, but spiritually at least, and living a life of lies. They support their fellow prophets. They never stop doing evil. They've become like Sodom and Gomorrah. That is the symbol of ultimate evil, by the way, in the Bible. Sodom and Gomorrah were committing sexual sins, and that's the ultimate of evil. Well, he compares the preachers to what they're doing. Shocking stuff. I didn't say this. Jeremiah did. So this is what the Lord All-Powerful says in verse 15 about these Jerusalem prophets. I will make them suffer. That's a terrible threat. Their food will be bitter, their water like poison. I will punish them because they started a spiritual sickness. Are the preachers listening to that? Are they trembling at that? Is every preacher in Georgia here saying, my goodness, that could be me. That's an awfully threatening thing that spread through the whole country. They started a spiritual sickness that spread through the whole country. Well, they're all good people. Yes, I understand that. There are a lot of good people. There are a lot of good atheists, too, who would be very kind and, and do good things. However, that's not sufficient to measure up to the high bar, it seems to me, that Jesus and God set. You've got to speak the truth at the risk of being a failure big time. This is what the Lord All-Powerful says in verse 16. Don't pay attention to what those prophets are saying to you. Church members, if you're being lied to from the pulpit, do not pay attention. It's your responsibility to get to those people to try to help them. They're trying to fool you, verse 16. They talk about visions. I'm troubled by the lack of outrage. They're trying to fool you. Now, they're not trying to fool you deliberately, but they're careless enough that they haven't checked what they're teaching thoroughly with the Bible. They've just learned it in the theological college, and that's good enough for them. That isn't good enough. 17 now. Some of the people hate the real messages from the Lord. So the prophets give them a different message. They'll give them what they want. Preach to us lies, smooth things. Don't preach truth to us. Pay us to preach lies. That's a terribly bad situation. And so the prophets give them a different message. The prophets say, it's all right. It's all okay. It's all good. You'll have peace. They're lying, unfortunately. Nothing will happen to you. You're okay. You're all doing good. But none of these prophets has stood in the heavenly council. None of them has seen or heard the message from the Lord. These are the words of Jesus. You're aware of that, right? Seeing and hearing the message of the kingdom is the whole standard by which Jesus judges. But the preachers who are getting this wrong are saying, nothing bad's going to happen to you. You can promote abortion. You can sell the body parts of little babies and get away with it. No, you can't. So we come along and say, wait a minute. The standard is higher, the bar is higher than you're setting it. None of them are seen or heard. That's the language of Jesus. You have to see and hear the message of the kingdom to repent. 
That's an, another subject. But Jesus makes the bar very high there. You either believe in the kingdom of God or you don't. Verse 19 says, Now the punishment from the Lord will come like a storm. All of these parallels with nature. His anger will be like a tornado. My goodness, that's terrifying. It will come crashing down on the heads of those wicked people. This is verse 20. The Lord's anger will not stop until he finishes what he plans to do. That's the key verse. God is frequently angry, wrathful at his people. So is Jesus too. Remember the seven woes that Jesus did against the establishment. Woe to you, Father. That's a strong word. You're under a curse. Watch out. You're going to be destroyed. This is very strong language. In the last days, you will understand this clearly. That's that famous Hebrew, acharit yamim. The last days in Isaiah 2 are when the nations are going to stop building weapons and killing each other. We're not there yet, but that's the aim of the kingdom of God in which you are invited now. You're recruited, if you like, by Jesus to take part in that kingdom. 21 goes like this. I did not send these prophets. I didn't call them. I didn't invite them to be prophets, but they ran to tell their messages. They're out there getting their degrees from seminaries. They're not really checking what they've done. It's an awful fate that hangs over them. I didn't speak to them. What? God didn't give them the message. They just invented it. That's awful. They spoke in my name. They spoke as representing. Jesus loved these passages. Many will come and say, look what we did in your name, Jesus, only to find out that they are completely rejected. They hadn't got the truth. They spoke in my name, verse 21. If they had stood in my heavenly council, there we have it, right? If they'd listened to the people I really had commissioned and stood in my heavenly council, then they would have told my messages to the people of Judah. They would have gotten the theology right. The point is you have to stand in the council of God. You remember that the Pharisees rejected God's counsel by refusing to be baptized by John. They said, well, I'm not going to be baptized. I know of a group today, ex-way international people, who shake their fist at water baptism. Oh, it's all good. It is not all good. It's a very dangerous thing to refuse to be water baptized because it's commanded in the Bible, repent and be baptized. That's not difficult. So people come up with their schemes which fly in the face of the plain truth of simple theology. If they'd stood in my heavenly council, verse 22, they would have told my messages. They would have stopped the people from doing bad things things. So if you correct somebody out of love, you're doing it to try to help him. You're, you're playing the Ezekiel role. Ezekiel was told, if you don't warn these people, their blood is on your head. So we better be busy warning the people if we find that they've gone astray. So I don't know that we're doing enough. Again, you can write to the newspapers. You can write 23, this message is from the Lord. I am God. I'm always near. I find these verses very encouraging. The simplicity of the way it's translated. I'm God. I'm always near. I'm not far away. Someone might try to hide from me in some hiding place. I love, I love the style here. It really attracts me. Some pipe, somebody might want to hide away from me, but it's easier for me to see that person. Very easy for God to see that person. Because I'm everywhere in heaven and earth. That is what the Lord said. There are prophets who tell lies in my name. Jesus loved these passages. They say, I've had a dream. I had a dream. I heard them say those things. How long is this going to go on? The Bible says, verse 26, they think up lies and then they teach them to the people. Could that be happening in your state, in your church, locally? Are you questioning? Are you simply accepting it because you're not energetic enough? They're trying to make the people of Judah forget my name, which doesn't mean forget how to pronounce it in Hebrew. Let's put this in. There are people who are very concerned about getting God's name correct in Hebrew. It's nothing to do with pronouncing the name in Hebrew. My name is everything I stand for. Jesus said in John 17, I've given them your name. Meaning he told them how to pronounce Yahweh? No, he didn't. No evidence for that. I've given them your name and they've accepted your word. I get it. The word of God is the name of God, everything he stands for. So I have to get that in there. So the Jewish roots people insist on saying Yahweh or Jehovah or Yahweh or Yahweh or Yahshua. They're simply making the faith look stupid. And it's not a good advertisement to people outside. It's not an issue because the Greek... New Testament scriptures are New Testament scriptures are in the Greek language, the lingua franca of the day, the internet language of the first century. They don't make any issue about it at all. Oh, well, the word Yah is there in hallelujah. Big deal. This is the sort of finicky nonsense that the Jewish roots people inflict on the faith. 
when Jesus was asked, how do we pray? He said, our Father. He didn't fuss about Yahweh or Jehovah or how to pronounce that. Didn't matter to Jesus. Our Father. And they even remember that so well that they give it in the language that Jesus used at home when Mary spoke to him, called him into lunch. They used the Aramaic language, a sister language, the Hebrew. And they've remembered that. And Paul says, we're calling on God as Abba, Father. That meant so much to them that they remembered the exact Aramaic word, and it wasn't anything to do with Yahweh or Jehovah. If it's so important to say the name of Yahweh, yod heh vav -Heh, to pronounce it correctly, then you'd think that somewhere in the Greek scriptures they would have mentioned it. They were able to mention Abba, the Aramaic word. They were able to mention Talitha Kum, little girls, get up. They remembered the exact words. Such a poignant moment was that. Did they remember how to pronounce Yehovah, Yahweh? They didn't. So forget it. Get on with real life. The meaning of God's name is everything he stands for, everything he represents. And the preferred title, according to Jesus, is Father's. You must treat my message carefully like a fire or like a hammer that can smash a rock. Isn't that a good image? Think about that. Get up with a big sledgehammer and, and hammer a rock. That's the effect of God's words, how seriously we should be taking it. This message is from the Lord. And in verse uh, 30, this message is from the Lord. So I'm against the false prophets. I would hate to have God against me. That is the one thing that a preacher doesn't want to have. They keep stealing my words from one another. Plagiarizing. I'm against the false prophets. This message is from the Lord. They use their own words and pretend that it's a message from me. I'm against the false prophets who tell false dreams. This message is from the Lord. They mislead my people with their lies and their false teachings. I never commanded these false prophets to do anything for me. They cannot help the people of Judah at all. This message is from the Lord. And so it continues, but it's very powerful. I recommend that as a, as a reading for you this week, the 23rd of Jeremiah.